So you are doing okay? Yes. Everybody's doing all right? I know uh, life has its ups and downs and everything that we go through and things we deal with. And as we talk about, and I say so many times, the roller coaster of life that one day it's all heading uphill, something moved, and then it's all heading back the other way. And one person's telling you how blessed they are and somebody else is telling you I'm going through all kinds of trouble and hurt and so on. And yet we continue on and keep serving the Lord and doing what he says uh, in the midst of it all. And it's life. And it's life as we have here in the earth. Yes. Are we on? Anybody on there? If, uh... Okay. Maybe I disappeared for a minute. <laughs> uh, a lot of people would say in the way things are nowadays, anything is possible. Um, a strange thing, and you know, I, I try not to go too far in some of these things and try to not become sort of cynical because so many people don't want to acknowledge anything that's going on in anything. Uh, I was at a sporting event and the one team was getting beat pretty good and so on and the fella said to me, well, you know, that means when they come back, it'll be all the sweeter. And they just get, kept getting pummeled and pummeled and pummeled and you think, like, this is like everybody's mentality and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't face reality and face the truth. There's something wrong with us. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we, you know, evil's winning and evil's triumphing and evil's, you know, whatever, and where's the Lord? There should be none of that in any of us, right? I mean, maybe to just start the morning with a thought of reality of what you hear out here in the world, like, well, wait a minute, can't you, like, observe that this group of guys looks way bigger and way stronger and way faster and drive, you know, when you're talking maybe football or whatever, if the offensive line is driving the defensive players totally out of the way and it happens for 10 or 12 or 14 plays in a row, you got to realize, I think they're going to keep doing this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, it'd be like your house is on fire and you stand outside and say, well, when it starts to pour down rain, it'll be beautiful. The fire will go out. No, you got to call the fire department. You got to realize there's a fire going on. Um, I, I don't know, it, it's a strange thing, but uh, so many people are in, I don't know if you're hearing all this like I hear, and some days you may say, why do we start like this? Or why do you start talking about that? People that are getting into new age and new thought and uh, this stuff where they don't acknowledge anything of what's out here in reality and they're living a life and you're being as parents and grandparents warned about what song lyrics with some of these popular singers and the things that are happening and all this stuff and nobody wants to acknowledge any of this well oh it'll all work out no it doesn't all work out that's why we're called into a battle the bible says right that god has called us into a battle and we're fighting in a warfare here and that we have to stand in all these things how many of you feel like fighting today Probably hardly anybody does. But you know what? We have to fight. Otherwise, we get overrun. Amen. Right? When you're out there on the freeway, you're driving out in Los Angeles somewhere, you can't drive like you drive here in Warren, Ohio. <laughs> right? Because there's more than nine cars on the road when you're out there. I used to tell a friend of mine up in the Cleveland area, you know, you got caught in a traffic jam, there's 150 cars in Warren. If there's nine cars in a row, we don't know what to do. <laughs> it's a big deal. And so you look at all these things and face reality here. The Bible tells us, we're going to be in Thessalonians, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4. And maybe I should switch where I was, the way I was going to do this today. Uh, will be in chapter 4, but in chapter 5, listen to what Paul said to the church that he'd been ministering to there, and it basically tells us they're young in the Lord, it's a new founded church, and so on, but in chapter 5, he said, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, and I wasn't really going to do much with that this morning, but in all this, we've got to pay attention 
to the season of where we are right now where everybody wants to hear a wonderful thing. If you're not watching the news, you see Israel was getting pummeled last night or early this morning, which would be, uh, this would be almost evening time coming up over there now. They're getting pummeled with rockets. Well, later on when we read here, and they shall see, say peace and safety, well, who do you think he's talking to? The Israelites. Amen. Israel being attacked, war against them and so on. And uh, of course, against us as the church, but not in the realms that they are. But so they're so weary of being abused and accosted and Holocaust type events and attacks and warfare from here and warfare from there to where they're going to say peace and safety. Oh, finally. Like it'd be like with a lot of us, no relatives have your phone number anymore. They don't call you. They don't, you know, you don't hear from your children for a while where they've got problems and troubles and, you know, neighborhood things. And all of a sudden, America is surging again. The economy is good and gas is $1.97 a gallon again. And you can travel freely and hotel rooms and flights and everything go back down 45% to where they were a little while ago. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> But in reality, you've got folks telling you that's not going to happen again. And so you have to realize where we are. So he's saying, of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. You know very perfect, perfectly that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. Right? Amen. How many of you know he's coming to you as a thief in the night? Amen. Wait a minute. Read the rest of the scripture. You know it doesn't say that. No, it doesn't say that. He's not to be a thief in the night to you and I. We're to know the season of when he's coming. Yep. We won't know the hour and the day, but it's just like when you, you're not out there today in your winter coats, right? But you know that when winter starts coming around and it's the season of cold and flu and all that kind of stuff and freezing, you start to say, I better have a coat in my car. I better go to this event with a coat. I better prepare in case this happens and so on. Because you know the season and the time. Don't let people try to fool you with this new age philosophy stuff. And again, the what's it, new thought and, uh, you know, the one where it's almost like repetition, uh, that your words are going to change everything. Uh, yeah, we have power in our words, especially when we're doing what the scripture says, but we're not God that's going to change everything out here. Amen. I told you I was going to say something, and I think it's going to fit in right here, even though I never planned on saying this today. But since we got to that, how many of you are speaking the name of Jesus over everything? Because the song told you to. Why didn't Paul go out and say Jesus over everything and everything change? No more anxiety, no more frustrations, however it goes. I forget all the words right now, but some of that's in there. I speak the name of Jesus over you. Nice song, no doubt about it. Nice words, nice tune, everything. But is that life? No. Just speak the name of Jesus over it. Everything will change. Then why aren't you and I further along? Why aren't they more mature in the Lord? There's something going on here, everybody. You have to know the Lord to be able to... Something really happening out here to where everybody's got this idea. Well, I'll just... That's it. And I don't have to do any warfare. Why should I intercede? You've heard me talking about intercessory prayer here lately. Why should I bother to intercede from, for anybody when all I have to do is say, I speak the name of Jesus over it all. Family matter, I speak the name of Jesus over it all. It's all done. I don't have to do anything. But yet we've got men that we read about that are examples who suffered, who warred, who stood against, who were confronted and confronted kings and everybody else. Amen. Because the easy way out would be, well, I just speak the name of Jesus over it. In other words, what I'm doing is I'm basically dismissing it. 
in all reality because I don't want to be bothered with it. I don't want to deal with it. Somebody comes to you and tells you they're being tormented by demonic activity and so on in their thought. Well, I just speak the name of Jesus. You're okay now. But they're not okay. <laughs> they need somebody to walk them along. They need to Amen. be held by the hand and they need to be able to speak every time they have these thoughts. And somebody say, well, listen, no, we're going to resist that. We're going to pray with you. We're going to stand with you. Amen. Anybody hurt yet? Yeah. You're hurt? No. Oh, good. No, I, I know you didn't know what I meant. <laughs> I mean, hurt by me saying something oh, about oh. the song. Because don't you know that every Christian song is perfectly in tune with the Lord? And you can't find anything that's carnal or of this age type thing in them? They're not singing the Psalms. Remember, Jesus and the disciples were going to take communion when they came out from the uh, celebration of the Passover dinner that night, they went out and sang a psalm, scriptural, biblical, right on key with what God ordains, not somebody's imagination of everything and what they thought would be nice for you to hear and maybe think like. Does this make sense? Yes. Amen. I'm yes. just wondering, because sometimes I hear so much of this from people you know, I talk about the cliches a lot. Mm -hmm. Churches, we have to have ch cliches. We have to have sayings like the world sing, uh, has sayings. And then we have to have Halloween parties or some kind of party to make up for the Halloween thing. Doesn't matter that it's all wicked and evil, comes from demonic roots and everything else. Well, we got to have something because the kids out there are going to Halloween parties and they're going out trick-or-treating and knocking on doors and getting lots of candy. Well, so we got to have something to make up for that. We're the church. Well, we don't want them to feel left out. Well, I don't know. I used to go to booze parties. I don't feel left out. I haven't been to a booze party since I was 19. I mean, there may be some people boozing around me where I'm at some function or thing, but I'm not in that, and I don't feel left out. We need to teach them more about it and instruct them more. We had people upset because my wife brought out those little booklets about Halloween, like I said last week, about you got churches celebrating Santa Claus and having Santa Claus parties and Halloween trunk or treat because we don't want to say trick because then it would be exactly like what they do. And you go down through all these things. Listen, we got enough lies we got to deal with even as adults, Amen. let alone all this other stuff, things we believe that are nowhere true whatsoever. <coughs> okay, I got all that off my chest. <laughs> In reality, listen to what the scripture is going to talk about, though, in Thessalonians 4 there. Just go chapter 1. I, I know I took you over to 5 when they say peace and safety. Because it says there, well, let me, let me just jump back there for a minute here. Chapter 5, verse 4 says, but you brethren. Anybody here brethren in the Lord? Amen. The Bible says, but you brethren are not in darkness that it should overtake you as a thief. So the ones that are going to be overtaken as though a thief has come are the ones who are not prepared or not ready or not looking for and loving his appearance as we talked about when we talk about delusion. And so for anybody in here this morning, young or old, new in the Lord or long time in the Lord, whatever the case, you may say, well, I know all this and that's good. You should know it. But you need to be reminded of it because just like a lot of other things, somebody brought something to my attention and I said, you know what? I know I knew that, but that's been a long time ago since I talked about that uh, video somebody sent. I'm trying to think what it was right now. But anyway, I said, you know what? I already knew this. I've read it before. I've gone through it before. I just haven't heard it and I haven't said it at all for quite a while. So you need to be reminded all the time of certain things. And that's what this is all about. So you and I, it says in verse 5 of 5, are children of light and children of day. 
We're not of the night, we're not of darkness. So it should not overtake us as a thief. How are you preparing? How are you getting ready? I had shared with, uh, maybe I said it with us, I don't remember, but they're telling you because of weather conditions and things happening in California, there's going to be a shortage of tomatoes. So if you make a lot of tomato sauce and tomato products, what should you do if that's the case? Look it up and make sure it's true. I did. But if you want to do it yourself, look it up. So if you're going to have sauce products you make, if you're in the food business and sauce is a part of what you do for a living, you're going to order all the tomatoes you can store right now, even if you have them for a couple years because their shelf life is good. And you're going to store them now because in a six months to eight months from now, if they double in price because of a shortage, you've saved money, but you have product. Amen. Right? Amen. You have a stock of product. You invested wisely. Uh, if it only goes up by 30%, you've made 30% on what you've invested in, which is good principles. Good. And so you look at these kind of things, you pay attention. Okay, gas has gone down. As I've shared with so many before, we buy a contract of gas for here. So when prices are down, I buy it at that price and we have it for a long time after that. We're still using high test gas, which, did I talk about this? Seems like I, maybe I told the group I was with. Um, we had high test gas, high test was up to 4.69 a gallon. We were still using it at three bucks a gallon. We're still using it now, even though it's come down. We're using a high test at three bucks when regular is 319, I think. So we got better gas at less price. So we can have economics class in church too, yes. <laughs> right? Right in the midst of this. Amen. And after the election, uh, one reason gas prices have gone down is because the administration realized that there was something there that was set in place by a previous administration, and I'm not sure which one exactly, but they were able to do something to where it lowered the prices for right now. And so we'll see how this goes afterward because it always looks good when you get everybody moving around again and so on and saving a little bit of money uh, when you're trying to get reelected. <laughs> and you are not to be in darkness. What if we're not in darkness about everything? My gosh, somebody walks up and tells us a story and we go, you know that's not true because we're not in the darkness of where everybody else is just following along. You listen to a politician, you'll never do that. You know you can't bring that, make that happen. You have to have Congress and everybody else approve all this before you can say you can do these kind of things. Or are we in darkness? I just wonder when the one president was elected and are going to be elected or running for office and they said he's going to get rid of our mortgage on our house. I just wonder how many of those really came to pass. So what do we have now? Now we have somebody who's telling us, well, if you're a first time home buyer, we'll get you a big portion of money. We'll give it to you from the government, our gift to you from the government. <laughs> when did the government get a job? <laughs> it didn't. Amen. It's still all of our money, as our one sister said, she was blessed with what happened to her house, which is fine. If you qualify, it's there. They're gonna spend it on somebody anyway, yeah. right? So if you qualify, be honest, that's fine. Use it. Amen. No, no problem. Right. All right, let's get out of all that. <laughs> <laughs> so you are children of light. When we talk about being in the light, being children of light means that we're not living in the darkness of the world. Darkness means you can't see. We're supposed to be able to see, right? We're not supposed to be deceived by all the things that people are throwing around and the nations may be throwing around and whatever's happening out there. Okay, let's go back over here to uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1 through 4. <clears throat> and you tell me how you're walking in this. Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us how you ought to walk, there's three things here, 
how you ought to walk and to please God is number two, so that you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. And number three is that every one of you should know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. So number one is how you ought to walk. Number two is how you ought to please God. And number three is how to possess this vessel, which means keep it till the end, uh, possess this vessel in sanctification and in honor. What does sanctification mean? Set apart. Set apart. What else? What's it referencing? If you're sanctified, holiness. holiness. Yeah. You're set apart, and you're set apart for holiness, right? Which the Bible tells us, um, let's see, in Hebrews chapter 12, it talks about uh, in verse 14, he had told us in 13 of Hebrews 12 to make straight paths for your feet. In other words, listen, this gospel lays out a straight path for us on how to walk, how to be clean, how to obey God, how to love the Lord, how to follow him. Make straight paths for your feet, least, you, uh, least that which is lame be turned out of the way. In other words, you have some weaknesses, and so it'd be like your one leg is a little shorter than the other, so every time you walk, you're left leg maybe goes a little bit further and the next thing you know you're not walking a straight line you kind of veer off the path a little bit so he says make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way or that which is lacking but let it rather be healed so that you can walk straight and then he says follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the lord now, I'm not worried about preaching and teaching on holiness. I shared with you about the man who uh, started a new ministry, a friend, and he said to me, I got 100 people now, and <clears throat> I had 20 about three months ago, and, you know, the ministry's growing. And then he told me a couple weeks later, I preached on holiness, and now we're back down to 20 people. <clears throat> and after that, we had 12 people the next week. I'm not worried about preaching holiness because I think a lot of that's out of here already. Amen. Because you and I are to live holy according to what the Bible says. And if you say, well, I'm not, I don't know that much about holiness, that's what we're teaching you. How you ought to walk. How you ought to please the Lord. And how you ought to possess this vessel to where you keep yourself from getting caught up in all that stuff anymore, the defiling things, the things of the flesh, uh, so that you can please God. Because we know the times and the seasons and that now we need to be clean in the eyes of the Lord. We need to keep ourselves from a lot more stuff than we did before, right? Because we're perfecting holiness without which men will not see the Lord because the Lord is holy. Defiling things won't be in his presence. I mentioned to you in 2 Corinthians, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11 and 12 there, uh, where people were saying that, you know, if you have all these issues and you have these agendas and you have this alternate lifestyle and these things, that, well, that's your identity. So, you know, God is okay with you being what you are and having what you have and living the lifestyle you live. And that's not true whatsoever. They use this scripture. And such were some of you, but you are washed. That terminology in 1 Corinthians 6.11, you are washed, means that you are like wrung through the ringer in cleaning. And everything is pushed out that's not clean. Everything that is unsanctified is now sanctified. Everything that's unholy is now being washed and bathed in the word thoroughly to where we're clean. 
Our thoughts are clean. Our purposes are clean. Our intents are clean. Just like when we talk about truth, we can have some truth, but he says that he would that we have truth, as we read in Psalm 51 about two weeks ago, in the inner man. That means down in here, I'm not lying to myself, even though when I'm around all of you, I'm acting like I'm, you know, hungry for the truth, hungry for right ways and everything else, but down inside, I, I really don't want to do that. No, down inside, when I really want to do that, truth is like a magnet being drawn, drawn us to the right things and the good things. We talked about filling ourselves with the truth. Uh, I think it was on a Wednesday night, uh, so that it's pushing all, it's detoxing us of all of these things of the flesh. Such were some of you, because we had just read the list in 1 Corinthians 6, 10, and possibly 9, of some of the things that God does not like, that God hates, that won't be in the kingdom of God. And he said, you and I were all some of those types of people, but we're washed. We've been run through the ringer of the gospel, and the word has washed us clean of these things. And remember, Jesus at one time uh, said to the disciples um, about being clean, and he said, you need only to wash your feet. And people say, well, we don't know what he means by that. He was saying, basically, you are being cleaned by the word, but every once in a while, because of what you're around, you got to shake the dust off your feet, like he told them when they went preaching the gospel door to door. And so sometimes you're getting around stuff. You got to make sure that the Lord cleanse me of that. Uh, you know, I mentioned being at one of the football games and I had to like get away from there and say, Lord, cleanse me from all of this words that I'm hearing over here from these people. Like, you know what? I'm not used to that anymore. When I worked at the mill back in the very deep, deep part of the mill down at Republic Steel, it was like a, a pit. And they would say, once you get back there, everything is so foul. Well, my job ended up putting me there. So I listened to that all day long, and I had to ask the Lord to cleanse me every day before I even left that place and sort of leave it there. So I was clean, but I was around stuff that was unclean. Amen. And so I had to ask the Lord to forgive me and cleanse me. It was like shaking the dust off your feet from that deep area of the, the mill where I had to work at that time. The funny thing is, that was one of the highest paying jobs in the mill. Mm -hmm. So you are washed, it says, you are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Remember that word justifies. Justified means we're put in a proper relationship with the Lord. We're acceptable to him now. Amen. And we're all, all that through Christ Jesus and what he did. So you are washed. That means totally washed and cleansed and sanctified. And listen, if you struggle with any unclean activities, thoughts, and so on and things, listen, it's, you're not abnormal. The enemy throws thoughts at people all the time. Somebody crosses your path and there's a remembrance of some ungodly thing. Listen, ask the Lord immediately to cleanse you and claim the victory over the powers of darkness. Amen. Because remember, there's no condemnation to us that are in Christ. We don't have to dwell in that. Of course, we don't want to dwell in those thoughts. But we have power over that through Jesus, through the gospel. Okay? Amen. Furthermore, in chapter 4, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus. Listen, what the Lord did for us. We're going to talk about the body and the blood of Jesus a little bit this morning. What he did for us. How he suffered for us. The very idea that he took on flesh and blood. What a kind of a demeaning thing for him, the Lord, so that he could save us knew the extent of where he had to go to get us to believe, to get us to be able to follow, to defeat the works of darkness because the works were so strong in the earth and in the hearts of men. 
that he had to take on flesh and blood and die for us to have salvation. We exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk. And listen, I feel for a lot of folks, I hear people say that they're in church and I would pray it's none of the churches around that we know the people, the pastors and so on. Uh, they don't feel like they're being taught how to walk and how to grow or how to stand against the wiles of the enemy. So in some area of life, they've got to say, well, I must be okay, or this is how it goes, or, you know, the old saying, you're, you're only going to be as spiritual as those that you're around. You know, they tell you if you want to be successful in life and the world, hang around successful people. Amen. You want to be spiritual, hang around with people that walk in the spirit, that worship in the spirit, that pray in the spirit, that have the mind of the spirit, as the Bible says. They're not all flesh and carnal and, well, as long as we get through life. Uh, a football coach I was with, he said, you know, the coach tells me not to push him too hard. And he said, if they knew the coaches that we had when we were in high school, which I was only on the team for a year, but man, I remember what they put them guys through even when I'd go out there and watch them beforehand. And it wasn't a thing of, hey, take it easy. Hey, it'll be all right. Hey, you're good. It's okay. Well, we'll, we'll see how the go game goes. No, it was everything before you got in the game. It was, listen, no, you better push yourself harder. So when you have a, a coach like that, you see a team where all of a sudden the front line, the offense for you girls, I don't know if you know all this, ladies, or not. But, so the offense, they're taught to, to drive the defender back so the running back has room to go. And when you see that right off the bat, like I said, I watched them. Gosh, these guys are driving them all over the place. This is going to go on all night long. What happened? Went on all night long. I mean, I didn't coach for that big of a deal, but I coached a team when I was younger, and the kids ended up winning the championship. Um, a lot of them are the guys these guys are all looking to now and things, but that's not because of me. It's because of what went on later with their their. Uh, teaching and, and further in their career in football and that kind of stuff. But so, gosh, here we are, how we ought to walk. Listen, I've watched the coaches where they say, no, wait, your stance is improper right off the bat. That's one of the most important things. If you're, if you're down and you're leaning backwards and the guy hits you, you fall backwards. If you're leaning too far forward, uh, you know what? All he's got to do is pull you down from the shoulder pad and you fall flat on your face yep. how many of you played football not many okay i can tell by the way you're not really going along <laughs> with anything i'm saying i see you over there nodding your head yeah so you realize this stuff so even the basic principles of what goes on in all this stuff and listen that's why we want new people to get the basic principles the basic things you must be born again right you must Amen. repent and be baptized Amen. and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost because in that you're endued as it says right here again with the power to do everything we talk about and teach in the scripture how many people I was around even back in the beginning of my salvation when I was doing a Bible study there at the high school and teachers that were telling me that they were believers but I didn't see anything like, you know, any push forward in the gospel or that type of stuff. And then we found out, well, you've never been baptized. You say, I don't want to be baptized. I don't think I need to be baptized. And what the Holy Spirit, well, we all got the Holy Spirit. Well, it's not evident in your life. And what is that saying? There must be more than what you know, but for some reason you don't want that. I'm okay. You know, it's like a guy going through school. He's getting C's all the way through. He says, I'm okay. I don't need to study anymore or learn anymore. When if he would push a little bit, any of you learned that lesson the hard way like mm -hmm. I did? Amen. To where one day you got to be on a test. It was like a miracle. All of a sudden you would have believed in God. Uh, and then you started applying yourself and finding out this isn't so bad after all. But why wait till you're at... I think I was two-thirds of the way in 11th grade 
a little bit longer I'm out and I'm a senior and now it's too late to do anything. All that stuff. Amen. That as we, or as you have received of us how you ought to walk. And so uh, I can still remember a, a young girl who gave me a card one day and said, you know, I've been hanging around these other people who said, you don't have to do this and do that. And, you know, you're okay sort of walking the way you are. And she wrote in there, you made me think I should walk differently and, and walk better than I am. And I'm glad. Like, wow, how many of those cards would you like to get? <laughs> not really that you're doing anything. I'm just reading the scripture. And I'm not telling you, hey, we're all justified no matter what we do. We all swear sometimes. We all talk bad about people or gossip. We all do. Don't worry about it. No, you should worry about it. You should be concerned. We need to overcome all this stuff. Imaginations, things we think about people that aren't substantiated. My wife and I have been having conversations lately, and I'd say, well, where did I get that from in the first place? Let's not talk about it anymore. I don't remember where I got it. I don't know if that's sure. And, and situations and things. And well, let's wait and see. And I guess if this person said this is what time to be there and this person said this is time to be there or whatever the case, let's just wait and see. Somebody will clarify something along the way because we need clarity. You have received of us how you ought to walk. So from the very beginning, we're teaching people how to walk with Jesus. Now, that would be pretty difficult if we ourselves don't know how to walk with Jesus. Amen. If we ourselves don't know how to put our own desires down, uh, you know, our own way of doing everything to say, I've got to conform to the image of what this Bible says. I can't do this my way. I've got to do it the way the gospel says, the way he lays out for me to do. Because every one of us is to be dying to ourself, right? As we go through all these things, and that's what we're teaching young people who come to the Lord. And that's the thing about a lot of the younger folks who say, well, I don't want you to tell me how to do it. Well, how many of your children just got on a bike one day and started riding? You, you taught them how to... And you even bought them little assistant wheels to put on there and so on. You bought them a bike where you could lower the seat way down because otherwise they couldn't even get on it, right? Amen. All this kind of stuff. Amen. And so now we have people that are saying, I don't want training wheels. I, I want the seat left all the way up there. Well, wait, your feet can't reach the pedal. How are you going to ride the bike? And well, that's all right. I'm going to do it anyway. And you know they don't do it. They're not getting it right. They may wheel down the road a little bit, but once it's time to pedal, what happens? You fall over on your side. And then who do you want to pick you up? Mom! <laughs> Come and get me. Help me. And so we try to teach right from the beginning. I remember saying when we had a lot of younger folks here, that listen, the sign out there says the Church at Warren Healing and Learning Center, you're coming here to get healed and to learn, you're not coming here to teach us how to do church. And somebody will say, well, you're that religious thing, this, that, and the other. Well, you know, one day you gotta get off that stuff because you're out there on your own, not really submitted to anybody or anything and doing it all your way. So I wonder how much of you is really dead to you and serving the Lord. I mean, Jesus taught in the synagogues. The disciples taught in synagogues. Yes, they taught in home churches. We got all these fallacy things going on out here. You're not allowed to have a building and you're, you should meet in the house because that's what they did in the beginning. Well, when they got so many people together, they met in big rooms. I think one of them we read in our Bible was an upper room, right? Yeah. So let's, let's get over this sort of a, well, we hate the establishment thing. I mean, I understand that. If we get to the place where you can't move without our permission, there's something wrong with us. Amen. If we can't change a little bit of what we do, look, what we haven't wanted to change, the internet and this stuff changes for us all the time. All of a sudden, the program won't work. All of a sudden, you can't upload what you usually load. 
All of a sudden, uh, you know, what happened to the sound? There's nothing here anymore. Electronics change everything. What do you do if we were, if we were this machine-like thing? We wouldn't be able to operate. But what do we do? We operate anyway, because we're not bound by any of that stuff. So a lot of people need to get off of these things and how church should be. Because one day church could be just like, hey, we're going to read the scripture. Well, I don't really want to read the scripture. I don't want to bring my own Bible. Listen, you've been a believer all this time. You can't carry a Bible to church. What about the people who go out in the woods in China, these places, and they lug a Bible for a mile to get there walking, and they don't expect it to be up on the screen? <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what it says or what we're doing. That's why I say some days I wish we never started doing a whole lot of this stuff. Because I watch people's faces and they're up there and they're not looking in their Bible. And then you're reading ahead, <laughs> which you could do with your own Bible, <laughs> right? How you ought to walk and to please God. So listen, go back over there to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and those things that are in the scripture before he said, but you are washed. Such were some of you, but you are washed. Listen, those were all things that didn't please God. And people are trying to say today that I can live in all of these and still serve God and he still loves me. Well, no, he loved you. That's why Jesus died on the cross. But he's not pleased with you whatsoever if you continue in abomination and the sinful things that are listed there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Right ahead of 11 there where he says, but such were some of you, but you are washed. So how you ought to walk and how you ought to please God. What pleases God? Is God pleased that you amass great amounts of wealth? Or is God pleased that you give? Because he says he loves a cheerful giver, right? Amen. So that's not a hard question. So with whatever you amass, do you give? If you do, then God may bless you with all the more. That's up to him. However, he does that. Uh, we read about the men of old, they had plenty of things and so on, but they honored God and loved God with what they had. So how you ought to walk and how to please God so you would abound more and more. So you came to Jesus one day, you said, I want to walk with the Lord, and we want you to walk with the Lord, but we don't want you just to be in the Lord, we want you to abound in the Lord. And so when the preaching and the teaching is really inspired by the Spirit of God, it's going to cause you to change some of your ways. You know, there were a lot of things when I first got saved that I liked to do that I never went and did anymore. People ask me about playing golf because I grew up on a golf course, uh, met some of the pros, all that kind of stuff. But when I came to Jesus, I didn't play golf for 25 or 30 years. And then some pastors were going out and I went with them and I probably went four or five times and hardly ever since then again. Although I knew everything about it, I studied it, I watched the pros, I knew the hand grips, I knew how to hit a, a slice, I knew how to hit a hook, you know, I knew how to judge the greens, you know, the lay of the greens and so on when you putt, all that kind of stuff. I'll explain all this to you one of these days. <laughs> okay, it's like when you go out in the front yard out there and uh, you, you know it rained and you're going to cut the grass and you kind of look at the yard and you can see where it goes downhill a little bit. What happened there when it rained? The water runs down into the lower part. So when you're on a putting green and you look at the green and you see that the green goes down this way a little bit, you know when your golf ball gets up there, it's going to roll down that way just like the water rolls into a puddle out there in the low spot in your yard. Does that make sense? Amen. Yeah. Okay, that's your golf lesson for today. <laughs> so it's so you will abound more and more. It's not just to say, I accepted Jesus. Because in this, we're to walk with him, we're to please him, and we're, of course, so we abound in all of this. In other words, it becomes more a priority. Jesus became a greater priority than golf Amen. in my life. And then, of course, all the partying stuff, he became a greater priority than the partying. 
than the friends that I was around at the time. Although when I would see him, I would talk to him and whatever, it wasn't like I was abstaining from him, although I had to abstain from what they did because I loved Jesus more. Amen. And so to teach people to abound in this, and somehow, you know what, even some of your mindsets and your old ways, you know, you, you abide, you, you dissolve, you get rid of that stuff. I want to think like the Bible tells me to think and be aware of what he says. So you would abound more and more, and that's why we tell people, now, now you need to repent of your sins, first of all, but now you need to be baptized. And now that you've been baptized, listen, follow the Lord, receive the Holy Spirit, let him do you from on high with power. But not only that, how many times we've prayed with people up here to receive the Holy Spirit who suddenly there's like an opening up in them and all they do is sit there and just sort of weep. Or, you know, you can see a joy come over their faces because they've been oppressed by so many things for so long. The ones that weep, it may be hurts. It may be long-term things, childhood abuses and everything else. The Bible says this word and the, the spirit of the Lord is cleansing us. So getting all that stuff out of us so that we can be free Amen. and serve the Lord. Amen. How you may abound. Abounding means, you know what? You're not bearing about all these burdens through the rest of your life that are always kind of keeping you from really, it's like when we have praise and worship, keeping you from being able to freely lift your hands up and say, I praise you, I love you, Jesus, I thank you, Lord. You know, you're not bound in your head anymore. You're not bound in the spirit man anymore. You're not hindered from opening up and lifting up your voice and praising God. That's what all this is about. We're to be praising and worshiping and understanding. So when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, because when I was younger, I can tell you that I didn't talk to lots of people, although I knew a lot of people and so on. I was always off on my own. I was like a shy, backward guy. But when I got saved, all of that changed. And I don't know now, some people get upset because I try to talk to them. <laughs> try to get in, hey, come on, talk to me. Like, hey, what are you doing? How are you? Hey, I'm not bound by that anymore. There's people that look intimidating and fearful and everything, or scary or whatever. I, don't, I try not to let that hold me back from anything anymore. I mean, I look at all of you. <laughs> day after day, you look at me. Wow, there is some weird stuff in this world, isn't there? <laughs> For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. And we're to be given out the commandments in all this. Somebody had told me, and I've said this, you've heard it many times, told me you shouldn't teach out of these uh, epistles because these were just letters that men wrote to the churches. Well, gee, in Revelation 2 and 3, there's letters written to the churches that were to be read to all the churches came by the Spirit of God, by the revelation through John, the revelation of Jesus to be read to all the churches. Why would we not use this to teach? Is anybody offended that it said here that how you ought to walk or how you ought to please God? I mean, this is good godly counsel Amen. because that's how we're to live life, walking with the Lord, pleasing the Lord. And what do we have to have to please the Lord? faith without faith it's impossible to please him which means we trust him we believe him we believe in the resurrection we believe in the second coming all these things you know what commandments we gave you by the lord jesus and so everything we're teaching and preaching uh yeah i could say well here's what i would do or how i see it but if i'm reading you the scripture you should say this is the most or the utmost importance of what i do that I walk with him, that I please him, uh, that I possess this vessel in holiness and cleanliness. cleanness. Amen. You know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God. Anybody looking for the will of God? We know there's plenty of places here. It tells us 
about praying his will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and so on. It says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So if you're in a church and that church is telling you you need to become holy, you need to be clean, you need to be righteous, you need to live upright lives, you need to put away the lust of the flesh, uh, you need to put away the vanity of mind, uh, the lust of the eyes, you know, uh, as Jesus we talked about and we have to finish up with the beware of. He said beware of covetousness or covetousness, however you say it, whichever way you say it. Beware of covetousness because a man's life does not consist of the things he possesses. So in all of this, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So the guy who preached holiness in his church and lost 80% uh, of his congregation, it was because he was doing the right thing. Teaching people how to be holy before God. Amen tells me that 80% of the people did not want to be holy, did not want to be clean in the eyes of the Lord, were not willing to lay down what they do and what they think so that they could please God. And do you think they'll make it in the end? Probably not, because there'll be so much more to come along the way. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Of course, we know fornication in the one sense means lustful, carnal, sexual things and so on, but it also means spiritual fornication or adultery, that you're not lusting after other things that may be possessions, that may be wealth, that may be, you know, a prestigious position where everybody looks up or to be the idol everybody looks up to. You may say, well, I'm just working a job or I'm just raising a family or any of those. Well, listen, that doesn't mean you're not being enticed in other things. Just like the idea of peace and safety. Well, you know, I just can't wait till nobody ever calls me again. The phone never rings and nobody tells me their negative thoughts and this and that. I just can't wait till that day. Well, listen, that day won't come until it's our last day because this is going to be this way forever. But we don't have to fear that or fret it or, you know, gosh, I don't want that happening to me. No, how about we pray like, Lord, help me to be strong Amen. when all that comes so that I can deal with it all. Amen. How about so, Lord, you know what? I don't want to be discouraged. I don't want to look on things after the outward and say, well, where is the Lord? Why isn't he working in this when you said you are working in it? Thank you, Lord. It would have been way worse. Thank you, Lord. They would have taken more from me. I got robbed, but they didn't take everything. Whatever, I mean, in all of this, not that you rejoice that you got robbed, not that you rejoice that you have cancer, but Lord, what will you do in this? Amen. At least look to the Lord first and ask him to move or have his way in all. Amen. This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So don't get weary in life and start to think that it doesn't matter whether I do good or evil. That's written in the scripture in the Old Testament that God does neither good or evil. Oh no, God is aware of everything. God responds in everything. And so you and I have to make sure we don't get weary to where we begin to think that or say that. To abstain from fornication. Uh, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. So in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verse 26 and 7, it talks about him sanctifying and cleansing this vessel with the washing of water by the word. You say, well, you know, do we have to hear the word all the time? Do we have to have it taught and preached or whatever? Or should I read my Bible all the time? Listen, the more you read your Bible, the more you hear the word of God, the more you sit under this, the cleaner you're going to be if you will submit to what's being done, what's being said. Welcome the washing of the water of the word flooding through our souls. 
purifying us, cleansing us. How many times, uh, you know, when the water current changes, uh, sometimes in the ocean there, or it can happen in a lake if there's sand, but when the water current changes, all of a sudden the sand is moved and they find a treasure. Guy that found that statue, I think it was bronze or something, that was only 60 or 80 feet or yards off the coast of the shoreline there, but nobody could see it because it was buried in the sand from back in the days of the pirates and whatever it was, or the Spanish Armada, I forget what, but he found it right out there. It was there all the time, but nobody saw it. But the washing of the water and the changing of the current. So maybe next week if I preach from over there in the current or in the corner, the current will come from a different way and you'll see something you never saw before. <laughs> An area of you will be changed that you never saw changed before. That's what it all represents in all of this. I don't know, does that make sense? Yes. The tide goes out, the tide comes in sometimes. Of course, the ocean, I don't see, we, we, we've noticed that they keep telling us it's going to be lowered or it's going to be raised because of everything happening in the atmosphere, but they show you monuments where the water level is exactly the same 20, 50 years ago as it is today. So where is that water? We're in a continuous cycle uh, when we did with the young people. I think we did it in church one day also, the cycle of evaporation and the lakes and the mountains and everything, how it all works and it continues and continues. Yes, you have droughts and dry times like we're having right now. And like I said, in California, the tomatoes and things they're telling you stock up with, but it's still the same. The earth goes on. And we're not going to destroy the earth because God's not going to allow that. He said he's going to purge the earth. So we don't even have to fear all those things. So this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification, holiness, real purity, having been fully washed, as it denotes in the, uh, in the textual meaning, and, uh, and honor. You know, we talk about in the house, there's vessels of honor, right? Mm -hmm. And so he says, you can be the vessel of honor. I can be the vessel of honor. It's just like anything else. The more you polish something in your house, the shinier, shinier it is, right? You can have two gold objects, one that you never touch and one that you polish all the time, or silver, or you can talk about your shoes. <laughs> Simp keep it simple. Polish your shoes every couple days and they always look neat and bright and they got like a spit shine to them. Or you can have another pair of shoes you kick around in, which actually if you look at my shoes today, I have a pair at home that I used to cut the grass because they wore out. I don't shine them anymore. They look like just dull, rough, dirty looking black shoes. I keep them in a place where they don't mess with nothing. But these shoes, I'm not going to come to church like that. I clean them, I polish them. I want them to look good. It depends on how we take care of what the Lord has given us. Amen. So if we see ourselves as I want to be an honor to the Lord, we're going to take care of ourselves. And we may dress nice and comb our hair nice and everything and smell nice. But like the Bible says, we got to be aware of what's on the inside, right? That it's not defiled. Every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So we're teaching all the time, this is what you want to stay away from. These are idolatries you don't want to get involved with. The world's lyrics and so on. I mentioned about Taylor Swift, which I guess everybody's talking about right now. Some of the witchy things that are in the, the language of the songs, some of the sexual things. <laughs> Uh, you pick up some of these books, they look like, uh, like uh, novels or they look like fiction, they're fiction books, and you start reading them and you go, oh my gosh, here your teenagers are reading this stuff and it's stuff you never saw until somebody introduced you to pornography. 
and it's in there being depicted in these books. And these kids are reading this stuff and we wonder what's going on. Why is uh, Halloween now becoming the second most promoted holiday and maybe very shortly here to overtake what they say Christmas celebration is? Because people like the darkness. Jesus said they love the darkness. They don't want the light to shine where they are. So listen, none of that's wicked anymore. Uh, you post stuff on the thing there and pe excuse me, people say, oh, that's old. We don't believe in any of that anymore. I see there's a new type of yoga out. Well, yoga is a witchcraft. It's a satanic uh, activity that's in an occult religion. And you and I, okay, if the world does it out there and they have it at the gym, well, that's okay. If they don't want to hear it, that's okay. But you and I who are supposed to know the truth, who refuse to acknowledge the evil and the wickedness that's in all this stuff, in the music lyrics, and the things that people are listening to, and we say, well, they probably won't remember it. No, it's all subconsciously being put in there. Do you remember the old days where they used to, uh, they finally found that in the middle of a, advertisement when you were at the movie theater they flashed popcorn up there in a split image and all of a sudden it was gone you didn't really even notice it but then all of a sudden you felt like having a coke no you felt like having popcorn because that's what flashed on the screen you see something and suddenly you think that's what you want and that's all part of what they've done with marketing so then you got to wonder what else do they use that stuff in you can go on the internet and all of a sudden they have these people they call doctors. You don't know that they're doctors unless you've gone and researched their licensing. But they're telling you if you use this, you'll get better. All of a sudden, if you check the sales of that stuff, they skyrocket. Just another one of those things, it'll be easier if I just take that. I won't have to lose weight. I won't have to exercise. That Ozempic pill that people are taking. Uh, they're finding out, or shots, whatever it is, they're finding out it's depleting everything out of your bones, yet you lose weight. Well, that's all I want is lose weight. I want to look like them up on the stage. No idea of what the repercussions of all that is. So you ought to know how to possess your vessel in sanctification, in other words, presentable to the Lord and honorable to God. Uh, you know, we can talk about how we dress should somewhat honor God, how we look, how we act, our uh, demeanor of things. It should all honor God to some extent. People should look to us like they did during the time of the disciples where they didn't dress and act like the rest of the world. And we know in Deuteronomy and back there in Leviticus and it's under the law and things, that they were told, do not do these cer certain things. People are finding out that even, maybe I mentioned this not long ago, even when it says not to mix wool and linen garments, I think we talked about this on a Wednesday night where they took some of these polyester garments, they found out the electrical uh, charge in those things depletes your system, where the linen and things, it causes a boost in your system, so in other words, when you start wearing all polyester, all the sports shirts are polyester, uh, all this stuff, that it's depleting your system while you're wearing them and you feel like run down or drained and tired faster because there's no en the real energy that's in living fiber. Just like when we talk about water, living water, moving water they had to use for the sacrifices and so on and uh, the washing, it was living water, moving water, because in that there's life. Positive ions, when you take bottled water and some of this stuff, you gotta wonder if there's any life in it whatsoever anymore. Because sometimes you've had it in the bottle for two years. It's still got a good shelf life on it. I don't know, is this all making sense? <laughs> or am I just going off on what I'm thinking here? <laughs> Possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. We'll stop right there in verse 4. 
You can go in Romans chapter 6 and read, just read some of chapter 6 there where it talks about holiness and how holiness is effective in our lives. And again, back in Hebrews 12, I know I gave you that already about uh, what it said, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So yes, you are to walk holy. You don't have to have your hair up in a bun. You don't have to have on a long skirt. You don't have to go without makeup. None of that is holiness. Holiness is, let it be the inward adorning of the heart. And you don't have to be all made up with everything on the outside. Because if there's a beauty in you, it's going to shine forth. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. Over in uh, chapter 5, Real quick, or did I read this already? Oh, in 5, 23 through 24. Uh, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Listen, if you will just cooperate with God, he will sanctify you. He will cleanse you. He will make you holy. The more time you read in your Bible, the more time you spend in prayer, the more in the fellowship of the saints right? The blood of Jesus cleanses us, it says, in the fellowship of the saints. The more and the more and the more we set that to be our affection. That's what we set our goal on. It says that he will sanctify you wholly. That means wash you completely. That means one day when you stand in the presence of the Lord, there's nothing there except a clean vessel of God. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, your whole and, or soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of the Lord. Be preserved blameless, sanctified, holy. How to walk, how to please God, and how to possess your vessel in sanctification and in honor. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. And we're just going to turn over to Luke chapter 22, if you will. And you can follow me with this. And did everybody receive your emblems this morning? We're going to take communion. Remembering that uh, I had a young man at one of the classes ask a question about communion and what gave me a little bit of what he thought about it and so on. And I said, well, I want you to go back, and I know it's in Exodus chapter 12 there, when Passover was initiated, and how in the Passover, uh, the bread and the cup would be used, the wine, to initiate the Passover. Actually, if you read Exodus chapter 12, hey, uh, excuse me, Jim, would you grab one extra one, please? Uh, Exodus chapter 12, if you read that there, if you ever want to know when the new year is, it tells you right there in Exodus chapter 12 that this will be a new, the new year. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, so it started at Passover, which is March or April, according to the Hebrew calendar. So everything we observe came from somewhere else, uh, which we might want to try to identify sometime, but it's not what God had in store. And even the, the Israelites, the Jewish people, have changed and made the new year to be in September, October area uh, with what they do in this time. And wouldn't you know I'd get one that won't. I opened one for our brother over there. I'll get it here. There we go. Uh, these things. This will be the last time we use these folks. Uh, we're going to go back to what we used to do, only in a little different way, a safe way for everybody. So you won't have to worry about a thing. Amen. Amen. So as we partake of communion, which are representative, the cup and the bread are representative of the body and the blood of Jesus. Uh, as Jesus himself was alive when he gave this to the disciples, as they were observing the Passover, he was alive there with him. They were not really eating his body and drinking his blood. Even them, it was emblematic of what he was setting in store for the new covenant. So in Luke 22, uh, he has explained to them about getting ready 
to partake of the Passover, uh, which began back in Exodus and was followed and to be followed all the way through to the end uh, to where the Messiah will take his people home. But in verse 13, it says, uh, he had described to them of where to go and what to look and watch for and so on as to where they would partake of the Passover. Verse 13 says, and they went and found as he said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, that's Jesus, and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He already knew what was laid out before him, but he wanted to partake of the Passover with them before that would come to pass. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So we know that there is a feast being prepared in the kingdom that all of us will partake of and Christ will be there with us as we take the emblems in remembrance of him. He's waiting for that time that you and I are all gathered to him and we sit down together Amen. in the presence of God. So it says he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you this do in remembrance of me. Then likewise, also the cup after supping, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. And then he goes on and says and warns about uh, Judas and the betrayal. So this morning, uh, Father, why don't you all just stand with me? And Lord, we lift this up before you today, the emblems we're about to partake of, uh, the body and the bread, the blood and the bread, excuse me. And we thank you. That, Lord, we remember a Savior. We remember God in the flesh. We remember that you were willing to abase yourself this far to redeem us from the darkness of this world, to save us from sin and damnation, from the curse of the law, from the curse of men, from the wicked one, the fallen one, Lucifer himself, to free us from all the bondage, the fear, the fear of death, death itself, that we could live forevermore. Sanctify these emblems and bless them this morning. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. So he took the bread, it says here, and he broke it, and they divided it and passed it among themselves. And he said, this is my body broken for you this do in remembrance of me as often as you take it and so lord we thank you for the body broken for us this morning we give you thanks and praise in jesus name amen amen thank you jesus we thank you this morning give you praise and glory hallelujah Hallelujah, Jesus. Remembering all the works that you did on the earth, all that is written. Ah, Lord, remembering that you stepped down out of heaven for us. You left the throne for us. You came separate of the Father in taking on our sin for us. Thank you that you've cleansed not only these things which are the shadow of but you've cleansed the whole the fullness we give you thanks and praise this morning thank you lord thank you jesus and then it says in the same manner he took the cup and he said this cup is the new testament the new covenant the new work that god would do for all of us in my blood which is shed for you. That we would remember him as oft as we drink it. 
the blood of Jesus shed for every one of us, shall we partake? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The blood of the Lamb, the sacrifice Lamb. The Lamb without spot or blemish. We praise you, we worship you this morning. Ah, uh, Lord, then to think back in our lives, all the things you brought us through, all the things we've overcome, all the things you picked us up in, all the things you nullified, all the things you freed us from, all of the teaching, all the instruction. Thank you, all the mercies, all the loving kindness, all the embracing, all the quickenings, all the reminders. Your love, your mercy, your goodness, your grace. Thank you, Jesus. We exalt you this morning, give you glory and praise and honor. The blood of the Lamb, the blood of the Lamb shed for every one of us. The plan of salvation from the foundation of the world. Ah, uh, you said if the princes of this world had known, they would have never crucified the Lord. Crucify that we may live. Became sin for us that we could become the righteousness of God. Thank you, Jesus. Worship you this morning. Ah, that you would just permeate our hearts and minds with the understanding and the knowledge and the remembrance. You left glory to be abused for us, to be ridiculed for us, to be spit on for us, to suffer at the hands of sinners for us. Oh, Lord, we praise you, we worship you, we exalt you, worship you, worship you, worship you so that we could possess these vessels in sanctification, in honor, that we would know how to please you, how to walk with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. I worship you. I give you praise. The blood. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the cross. Jesus, thank you for obeying the Father. Thank you for the work of faith still bearing fruit today in all of our lives, in so many lives, bear fruit into the future of the unsaved. Thank you through the cross you drew us, you said. Thank you that we were called by the preaching it's written in the Word. Thank you, Lord. Holiness and righteousness to possess these vessels in holiness. Without holiness, we will not see you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We honor you this morning. We worship you. Give you praise. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Holy is the Lord God. Holy Praise you, Jesus. Holy is the Lord God. I magnify your name, Lord God. Praise you. I glorify your name.